Okay. I'm not going to lie to you. I have not been really looking forward to this at all. Um, I'm sorry for anyone who is, has been waiting for this video for a while. I've been sort of busy. And I'm sorry if I um, sound kind of tired right now because I kind of am. Um, yeah, it's, I just have a, had a busy schedule and I know the turnaround time from the last video has been quite a while, like over a month I believe, or around there, a few weeks at least, I don't know. I've sort of lost count at this point and I'm obviously a lot beh really behind on um, commenting on the Mass Effect 3 ending. But um, And I apologize, this video is probably going to be uh, pretty impromptu, I don't really have a whole lot, I don't have any notes or anything to go off of here. Um, but. And I'm going to try and keep this video as, long, as short as I can, but I doubt it'll be that short, uh, considering I probably have a lot to say. And it seems like when I don't have notes, I seem to talk more than when I do, so uh, just stay with me on that. Um, but basically, I'm going to be breaking this whole video down into basically the ending itself, uh, the problems the, fa the fans had with it, basically, some problems I had with it, uh, what the extended cut did, um, and then... What I how I propose they could they could have um, fixed it the ending to be something satisfying at least not necessarily how I would have originally planned to end the game but something that fixes most of the problems of the ending to make it at least some at least adequate at least satisfying to a decent extent and then finally I'll um, have time to talk about um, the future of Bioware in terms of what games they're going to be uh, releasing and every and what's what's next for us. So without any further ado, let's just go. I'll just go right into the ending. Um, I, if you haven't seen any of my previous videos, my opinion about the ending is that it's terrible. Um, I I didn't like it at all. I the first time I played it, I was a bit confused about what was happening. So uh, because what I what I I, I think that um, a person has different um, viewing stages of a product or a or reading stages, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call it, when you're reading a book or watching a movie or playing a video game, when you're uh, regarding the plot, or yeah, yeah the plot and the story of, of, of an entertainment medium, um, is that there's different viewing stages. Um, the first stage is obviously just comprehending the plot, all right? Um, so basically this is just watching a movie for the first time, you're, so, you're starting to unfold the story is starting to unfold for you for the first time, so you don't really tend to question a whole lot uh, about what's happening on screen or in the book or whatever, because you, it's you're still absorbing and processing the information, right? So you're not going to be asking a bunch of questions because oh, there's a next thing that you don't know what's going to happen. So it's hard to think about something that happened behind, back then when there's uh, new information being thrown right at you. So you have to keep it's too difficult really to process uh, two things at one time on there because you're, uh, for me at least, I tend to get so absorbed in understanding the plot that I uh, tend to miss some some details that the director uh, or any of the other artistic teams made, like some of their decisions uh, and some of the plot points um, in, in the movie or whatever, or in the movie or video game. I'm just going to say movie from now on, not to jumble it up or randomize it. Um, so basically that's sort of my first viewing stage is just understanding the plot, understanding what happened. Um, sometimes I don't under sometimes movies um plots are very complicated, so I don't actually fully understand what the story was or the plot was um the first time around. Maybe watch it a second time. Now by that usually by the second time of movies I understand um fully what's going on. Uh I could say that for Inception for example. Um I didn't really understand that movie. Um after I watched it, I understood probably like fifty percent of it, and the other 50, the other fifty percent of it, I had no idea what was going on. So then I rewatched it, and now I still don't understand a hundred percent of it. And I think that this is where the, there's a, a line between uh, the viewer's intelligence and not understanding something, and there just being a lack of narrative coherence on the writer's and the director's part. That there, there's a fine line here, and let me let me explain this to you. Um, is that, for example, in Inception, some of those um, time mechanics or whatever about how they go into the dreams, I may not have understood that, but that doesn't mean that it's not really explained or you can't pick up on how that works um, just based on the context of the movie. But if for um, just things that are not uh, logical or don't fit in with the, within the context of the story that or within that fit within the the rules of the uh, of the universe or the world that's being uh, presented or portrayed on screen uh, for the movie, then that's a lack of narrative coherence and just laziness uh, and sloppy work based uh, on the writer's part. 
Uh, let me let me explain what I mean by this more uh, this narrative coherence thing that I mentioned about a minute ago. Um, this is basically I like to think of it as like a hallway, uh, like a straight hallway is probably is like the best possible thing, right? That just means that everything is very logical, everything follows some sort of coherence, um, so that the audience understands what's going on and it makes perfect sense within the within the context of the of the story, the characters, the plot, and the universe. Okay, every everything makes perfect sense. Okay. Another possible way of looking at it is um, if you're in a calculus or math or anything like that, you could think of it on the um, on the graph, the x and y axis. You just have x equals one and like x equals negative one, so there are just two vertical lines shooting straight up, right? It just look like a hallway, you could say, if you want to think of it like that, or you could just think of it as a hallway, except just view it like as if you're above the hallway and just you're like on a downward view, so you just see it like presented that way. Um, just think of it like that, if you can envision that. Um, that's saying that everything makes sense, right? Now, once you make things in the story that are illogical or that don't fit, um, for example, I'll just use The Avengers, because that came out on DVD about a week and a half ago, September 25th, so that wasn't too long ago. Um, for example, like, toying with the uh, the range of the character's abilities. Um, for example, let's just say um, Captain America. Captain America, based on Marvel Comics, based on the movies, or his, or his origin movie, Captain America, the first Avenger, um, let's just say, like, his abilities, he has superhuman strength and superhuman speed, I guess, to a, to some, like, a very, very marginal ex extent to the point where it's actually arguable that he isn't actually superhuman, it's just sort of, like, at the peak, although I'll argue against that, considering how, uh, in the comics, he sa it says he could, like, bench 1,200 pounds or something like that, and I wouldn't really say that's, I mean, that's slightly, you just, I would consider that sort of, like, uh, above human but level, but anyway, um, let's just say you. So you already have established based on the other uh, mediums or based on like the comic books, based on the rules within the the context of the of the movie. Well, it's a little bit tricky in this case because his origin movie is separate technically from the the Avengers movie, but it's all based in the same universe. So let's just claim that. And he's never. And let's just say. Um, He's substituted in for Thor for that fight scene, right? Uh, the Hulk fight scene in the middle of the movie where Hulk goes uh, savage and he's uncontrollable and Thor has to go in and fight him. Let's just say Captain America can suddenly be as strong as Hulk. Like he suddenly, it's like when um, Thor is, um, braces him with two hand, with both of his arms and he's holding him back and they're like basically in a, in a draw in strength, like both of them, they can't get an upper hand until Thor pushes up or whatever and with great effort and then he gets uh, hammered down. Uh, let's just say that's Captain America, right? Now it's already been established that Hulk uh, is has is based on the comics, based on the wiki, is able to um, lift in excess of a hundred tons. And rhetorically, I'll just say this: um, has technically infinite strength, which I don't believe. I don't. I don't believe that for a second. But he can lift a ton of stuff. He's very. His strength is not. He doesn't have a limit that we can, that we know of so far. His, his strength has not been tested exactly, so he doesn't have a maximum that we know of. Um, but anyway, to have Captain America, for example, just being able to be as strong as the Hulk that will not make any sense based on the context of that story because it's already been established that he is not that strong compared to the Hulk. And to have him suddenly be that strong with no sort of explanation or reason or uh, yeah, expl explanation or anything like that sort of just breaks the rules, right? Something just get completely broken, and that's where you have uh, you just like pick apart the hallway so that literally there's just spaces in the so in the um, in the lines. For example, if you use the graphic approach, if you have like the x uh, equals one line, you just like literally it's like taking an eraser and just taking a swipe at at bits of the line. So now like the hallway is not it's not even a uh, hole anymore. They're just po you're poking holes in there. And then other things, which aren't quite as severe, are basically just, um, like having, uh, an x equal, like, let's say a negative x squared graph. I'm, I'm sorry if you don't understand what this is, but basically it's like, it's just like literally taking, um, the sides of the, of the hallway and just like making them circular and just sort of like expanding them and just making it so it's not, it's just a bunch of random mishmash. Or you could just do like little mountains or something, like just little like triangles. Just imagine like the sides of the, um, of the of the wall or of, of the hallway have just like triangles now so they're all just sort of like 
they they look really weird and they're not connected or anything. It looks jagged, like the jagged edges and everything. That's basically what lack of narrative coherence represents. It looks ugly and it taints the whole look of the hallway. It's supposed to be able to be understood easily. That's when you have a problem on the writer's behalf. And let me tie it back to this uh, the the phase viewing here. I talked about phase one just absorbing the plot and stuff. Phase two is recognizing some of these problems. Now I understand movies and all this stuff have you know plot issues. I mean, there's that's just basically a fact. And let me there's let me clarify this. This does not mean movie mistakes. Let, let me clarify that for a second. Movie mistakes mean just a lack of um, um, lack of attention to detail based on the line producers. Uh, like for example, if um, I don't know, like if a character is talking and he has his hand um, like on a, on a glass of water right in his hand while he's talking to the guy, and then his thumb moves up like in one shot, and then he cuts to the other guy, cuts back to him, and then his thumbs moved up like three inches. That's just that's because it, it's not important. That's just sort of that's not like a flaw in the universe. That's just how that's just a natural shift in the actor's um, stance that uh, technically doesn't actually fit, but that's just. It doesn't affect the plot at all. It doesn't. Ha that's just a continuity issue, you could say. Um, that's n that's not something that affects the plot, and it doesn't go against the rules established because it's sort of irrelevant from the plot. Um, another example was um, uh, another example that I could think that I'm thinking of right now is in Lord of the Rings, the extended cut for the Fellowship of the Ring. There's basically a scene there where Frodo and Sam are um, in the forest, and there's a uh, a wave of elves uh, or a marching line of elves going through the forest. And um, there's a 180 degree um, shift in the in the camera where it's facing their uh, their faces, so you could see them, and then it's facing from the camera's angled uh, from behind them, and it's it you could the audience is seeing the uh, line of elves, right? Um, basically, it, the, their head their positions shift. Um, so Frodo's on the right side and Sam's on the left side when it's reversed in the other frame. Um, this is all. This is an, that's an example. Another example within that movie doesn't matter what which ex, uh, cut you have of it um, is when during the fight scene with the with the cave troll um, towards the second half of the movie. Um, this is when um, Legolas he um, is shooting an arrow into the uh, to, into the troll, um, but the sh the shot before that you could see him clearly fighting with a bunch of other elves or whatever, or a bunch of other. Um, orcs in, in the uh, little room they're fighting in and there's no time for him to be able to just suddenly do that um, that's just another continuity issue an editing issue that the editor didn't pick up on these are all issues that are just sort of um, a little bit sloppy just in certain in terms of continuity but they're not story problems they're not plot um, they're not plot aspects that are illogical or that are contradictory these are just sort of movie mistakes that are just uh, they, they don't affect the plot they're not central to the plot and and they're not they don't defy anything they're just overlooked um, overlooked uh, blocking and staging directions and overlooked editing things um, as well so this um, second viewing phase is essentially um, just analyzing and understanding um, plot aspects that you didn't before because you already understand the plot so now you're um, analyzing and interpreting it on a deeper level um, this is true this is sort of taught by um, many English classes today or if you've taken a film course or screenwriting course or anything like that um, basically you'll know what I'm talking about in terms of you understanding some of the um, artistic uh, decisions that these um, that these people make in their work and analyzing how things were shot and how it sort of supplements the plot and the story and the characters as well um, that, that 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 sort of thing essentially is what I'm talking about in phase two and that's what there is it's just multiple viewing phases um, and that's basic and it just keeps on going from there sometimes you you might learn something on like the 25th um, the, the, the 25th um, viewing of a movie that you didn't before there's no it's not like it's not there's no specific amount of um, time you watch a movie and you say oh I fully understand everything that the uh, director or the um, actors did in that particular scene or whatever it's a, it's an ongoing process and um, a lot of people don't really tend to do it um, but I'm I'm just sort of taught to do that um, kinds of stuff based on classes that I've taken and just my knowledge of the uh, my knowledge and experience of, the, of this whole uh, entertainment uh, medium and that's basically what I'm uh, what, what I like to do um, with movies and and any sort of well not even just movies just sort of any sort of story except for poetry I hate po I hate poetry um, so yeah, that's basically what I'm, what I'm
So, with that nonsense out of the way, you're probably wondering what the hell all this has to do with the Mass Effect 3 ending. So, I'm sorry if this whole that whole like 15 minute introduction was very long, but it just sort of got, got across some uh, points and how I sort of um, interpret things going into this whole this whole controversy and this whole ending. Um, let me just say, so basically the first, basically the co most common criticisms are essentially from uh, the point where Shepard gets knocked out by Harbinger and then uh, all the way to the end of the game. And that's basically where most of the problems um, start for everyone. Let me just say that I'm going to take one step back from that and go just the whole Earth mission, the, enti the entirety of the mission felt rushed to me. Um, it just sort of didn't feel exciting. Didn't, I didn't feel any urgency. I didn't feel like it was actually like a whole galaxy attempting to fight off these Reapers, mainly because a lot of the um, the streets and areas you're fighting in are derelict. There are not even any other soldiers or troops near you. I mean, I understand that the Reapers essentially wiped out a lot of the, um, the ground forces and all the uh, military might on Earth. But even so, you're getting all this backup, and it it would it would feel better. It would have a better uh, and more epic feel to it if there were more people uh, going into it, and so it would feel more of like a grand scale war. And yes, you do get to feel that in that one cutscene in the in the um, in space outside of Earth when they're all fighting. But I wish there were more uh, things like that on the ground. Um, but my ma my main issue is that there's no sort of um, combat choice. Sort of like remember in the uh, Mass Effect 2 suicide mission, you get to, you got to sort of choose who goes where, and you in there'd be different consequences depending on who you chose. Um, basically, whether they lived or died depending depended on um, who led or you know who who you sent into the vault into the uh, air vent or whatever. Um, all those choices essentially mattered, and they were they were choices you had to make, and. Um, None of that was really featured in the Mass Effect Three finale. Uh, or the, yeah, the last mission. None of none of that was featured, and I think I felt that there should have been something like that, except on a grander scale, because essentially the conflict, the final mission, was is supposed to be on a grander scale, because it's the whole galaxy fighting for survival. It's not just you infiltrating a base with, you know, less than like a thousand beings and one thing. There's millions of people involved in this last conflict, and I didn't really feel like that, and I didn't feel like you had any combat choice. Now I don't know if, if exactly if they promised that, but it would have been it would have helped a lot to make that the whole feel of that mission uh, a lot better and more more epic because it just felt like they're just sort of they're just bland um, bland fights you know they they were just bland fights like you're fighting the same exact enemies um, the whole time there's no enemy variety there's not a whole lot of um, spatial variety as well you're mainly just fighting in streets and stuff there's no sort of you know, there's there's nothing special about it, um, in my opinion. And then also, I felt uh, for the uh, one of the better parts of the one of the best parts of that whole mission, I should say, is when you're saying goodbye to your um, your teammates. Um, I felt that that um, that turret thing was very distracting from the whole mood of the entire of that entire scene of the that action sequence. While technically varied because you haven't really done that, it didn't fit in with that whole sequence because it interrupted the flow of everything when you're talking to the characters. Another thing that really pissed me off was uh, Garrus, who's my favorite character in the whole thing, uh, was uh, right before that point, he was sort of shrouded in darkness, and you could have easily just missed him, even though he was like the most important character in my opinion. He's my, he's my favorite character, and you could have easily just overlooked him and walked right by it because he was like in darkness, and you, I, could, I thought he was just a normal guy. I almost missed him, and technically I wouldn't have even been able to, um, to go back after that turret sequence. So I didn't really, uh, after thinking about it, that really pissed me off. That really bugged me. Now, for the actual ending of the thing, um, the basic complaints, or the big, the big three complaints from the, uh, from the fans initially were that the, the, the three choices were exactly identical in terms of their cutscenes, uh, or essentially their outcome, because you, all you had was the EMP blast from the Crucible going off, and there was just the, the green option, the blue option, and the red option, or the synthesis option, the control option, and the destroy option. Um, and that's basically it. The cutscenes were basically essentially the exact same by like 99%. If there was like this, the synthesis ending, you might get to see like some sort of mechanical circuits, or you get to see the people with green eyes, or whatever, they look a little different, but essentially the exact cutscene, the same rendered cutscene was used for every single thing, with just the color explosion being uh, differentiated. Um, and that that's just unacceptable. And yes, there technically were variants with the whole, um, you know, the whole Big Ben thing, whether that explodes or not, or like whether you see some, a few soldier, some, some ground soldiers on uh, on Earth, dying, or whether they're like um, pumping their arms up in in triumph after they see the um, or after they witness the uh, Reapers being 
fallen. Um, yeah, th those didn't really um, have any sort of uh, significant impact or um, significant value to me um, because it, with all the buildings lost, the Big Ben, yes, I, c I can understand that to some degree because if you're if you're um, British, I'm not, but if you're if you're British, that might you know they might take offense to, or you might ha be affected by one of the because that's obviously I believe one of the bigger monuments in um, in in Great Britain in London. Um, to have of one of those, I guess it symbolizes their people, and I guess to have that destroyed might offend people, or that it might have some sort of emotional impact. For me, it didn't. I can understand uh, if it does to some degree, um, but considering how like the, the destruction is already just sort of everywhere, like it wouldn't it doesn't really make much of a difference if that one building uh, goes down along with them all. It, it because everything's ruined anyway, so it doesn't make much of a difference to me. And the other people, like the other soldiers, you never even met them before. You have no emotional investment in their characters because they're just random soldiers. You never seen them before. I didn't have. I mean, yeah, it's nice that they don't die or they they um, they're in triumph or whatever, but you don't know the characters. It's better. It would have been better if they were actually characters that you knew because you'd be more you care you'd care more about them. So that's that's sort of stupid. But anyway, that's that's the first one, right? There's just there's no whatever. There's no, not no var, no variety. There's no nothing differentiating the no substantial variant that differentiates each little cutscene after those choices. Um, the the second one is that is the lack of um, closure to the game in terms of not being able to see or witness the um, the outcome of your specific choice. And yes. It, you have to sort of conjecture about what happens, and that, that to me is sort of unacceptable. That's lazy on the uh, writer's behalf because there's so many different variants that could have happened there uh, based on the original endings, I'm saying. And a lot of people were left to assume that the, that the uh, galaxy was essentially screwed over um, because the uh, mass relays went out and basically all, like, the galaxy was segregated from uh, the galaxy, the, each individual, sorry, each individual star system was segregated and separated um, from one another because there's no mass relays there. That's one thing from that, and this is just an, a sub point to that major point, right? Um, th that is the mass relays going out, right? That's one thing. Second of all, was that the EMP blast affected Joker's ship? So that means the other ones. I, I mentioned this before in my um, the Mass Effect Three, my thoughts on the Mass Effect Three ending controversy video. So you can skip this part uh, if you don't want to hear this. But basically, um, I should have said that earlier, by the way. But anyway, um, the second part is when that EMP blast presumably took out all those other ships too. So they obviously just sort of crashed together, or they cr or they're in a limp state in space, or they're um, you know they landed or they yeah they crash landed into each other or on the moon or on the earth somewhere basically all of them are just they're screwed they're all fucked I mean that that's the best uh, way I could put that and then the third is that the citadels um, exploded in in the two endings I believe except synthesis synthesis is the only one that doesn't explode or that doesn't explode po big portions of it um, so that means there's no sort of uh, central uh, council there's no sort of form of government that's sort of destroyed there their space for governing the whole population uh, to how any form of politics is now eradicated. So all, all three of those options basically led people to assume that all the hard work they, um, they, they put into the games didn't really pay off. And this goes into the third and final point um, of the fans is that um, the choices from your previous game didn't really affect the previous games um, didn't affect the ending at all. Um, nothing about who you saved. Uh, who or anything like that? What what small choices you had? N none of it had any significant um, impact on on the ending, and those were basically the big the big three problems that everyone essentially had with the ending. Now I'm not disagreeing with those those were I, those initially were what I was pissed off about. Uh, basically, as soon as I finished the game, I was just sort of like, "What the fuck?" And I actually called my friend over, and when he and he did, I sort of ruined it for him because um he was at the Cerberus base I think uh, when he when he was uh, playing the game after I beat it, and I called him up or whatever, and I said, and I told him how bad the ending was based on these three reasons alone, right? And then and he, after, when he finally beat it an hour later, hour and a half later or whatever, um, he, yeah, he, he was equally as pissed off as I was, if not more, in that moment. Um, and, that, and that was frustrating for us. Um, but now I'm going to talk about the, the real issues, I should say. The, ma the major issues that most people don't really tend to notice. Um, and there's a few of them. And there, there's different types. The biggest one is not the lack of narrative coherence, which I talked about, about the hallway thing. Basically, instead of a smooth, a normal hallway, our hallway is just bent and twisted everywhere, and there's holes in it everywhere. It's really ugly to look at, and nothing really makes any sense in this ending within the context of the story. 
Uh, nothing, nothing about the character. There's just so many inconsistencies, plot cons- inconsistencies, um, character inconsistencies. I'm not, I'm not gonna waste your time and like pinpoint every single one of them. Um, but if if you look, I I um, linked it to. I'm gonna link it uh, the uh, the uh, Google Doc of this guy he made. There's like 60 plus um, plot points that are just nonsensical, and um, he outlined them pretty well in detail. And I, I I've I have a few to add to my own, but I mean I'm not gonna talk about that part now. But if you're interested, I'll link it again. It's already on my the Mass Effect 3 ending controversy video that I posted, but I'll link it again. Um, and that, that's basically the biggest problem. And what the biggest problem stems from is the uh, is the catalyst, the AI godchild thing. Uh, that doesn't make any sense within the context of the story at all. Noth- nothing about that does. Even with the stupid um, the thing I just reviewed, the uh, Leviathan DLC, that doesn't that thing didn't clear up anything. And if anything, it added more uh, questions than it did um, answer them or any of the questions we had. It just posed more. So basically, the whole catalyst thing didn't make any sense at all. Uh, in my opinion, well, actually, sorry, it's not. It's not even my opinion. This is where it gets objective, and it's just nothing makes any sense based on the context of the story. Nothing about him did, uh, and I'll. I'm not going to explain why here because that would waste so much more time than I would need to. That's one. That's one reason. Anything. Nothing about uh, the whole Citadel thing with the elusive man. Nothing about the thing before with Harbinger and everything like that. Nothing about that made any sense. No, and nothing about the God Child made any sense. Nothing. And nothing really about the po- the post choice sequences made any sense. All right. Second of all, is that two? It, it, they ignore the, some of the build-up and themes from the pre, the previous games and the Mass Effect Three. One of the themes in Mass Effect Three, aside from this whole sacrifice thing, where you have um, Warden Thane and um, who the hell is it? Legion. He was the other one. Um, basically, they all sacrifice themselves and die for the for your cause. Um, and you can't you couldn't you can't do anything about it, which I wouldn't necessarily change about it because you have you have to have some sort of emotional feeling uh, of. That there are repercussions and there are of of this whole conflict, but I'm not going to get into that. But basically, um, one of the other sort of sub sub themes. It wasn't even a major theme, I should say, but it it was a de- it was decently um, you know promoted or advertised in this game uh, throughout. Is that the whole idea of a the synthetics and the humans or synthetics and organics cooperating together? Uh, or being peaceful together. Basically, two the two major things from that was it was a Joker and Edie's relationship. Uh, they were in harmony together, or whatever. You know, they beca- they fell in love with each other. I guess you could say. But I mean, or they're you know dating or whatever. They they're cooperating. And they have affection for each other, and they're it shows that they're just cooperating. They're together. They're peaceful. They're they can coexist peacefully together and uh, happily together. Second of all was resolving the conflict with the Geth and the Quarians. This showed that they that they were willing to help each other despite their differences and despite their past um, mistakes and conflicts. They were able to help each other there, and that that was number two is just you being able to cooperate. And they're fighting side by side to fight the Reapers. And the Catalyst is saying, "Oh no, it's a humongous problem." Even though there is no evidence based on this one cycle alone. That actually justifies that. Yes, there may have been in the past, but in this cycle, couldn't they have noticed that there was an exception there? I mean, yes, they, there is an ex, it is an exception. Maybe it happened in every other previous cycle, but why does it have to happen in this cycle? Maybe this is the cycle that breaks the trends of the other cycles. This is the whole, the whole that, that applies to this whole theory externally, not related to Mass Effect of the whole thing about you know history makes us learn from our mistakes. Maybe you know maybe that's finally the case in this cycle, and the catalyst somehow doesn't recognize that for some reason, even though. They have all these information and everything, and it, it's sort of it just the whole thing, the whole existence of that of that just contradicts the whole theme of that. Another thing, not related to that, is just the new central conflict, which is resolving this conflict of like of synthetics and organics, which has no has never really existed um, in in this series, and it's just being presented to you and hauled at you at the la- in the last scene, the last playable segment of the whole game before it goes to cutscenes. And you're introduced with a whole new conflict. Your primary conflict throughout the entire series has been to destroy the Reapers at all costs. It's always focused on the Reapers. Never on this other whole, this holistic or this other conflict of synthetics and organics. Yes, it sort of ties in with the Reapers' purpose and everything, but it's a whole new conflict that's being presented to you in the course of five minutes. 
that sort of negates everything that you fought for and sort of substitutes substitutes itself in for the whole just destroy the reapers thing and that to me is unacceptable it goes against traditional story structure and storytelling because you have like i said before in the indoctrination video you have your inciting incident um then you have your your build up you have like a sort of stage thing where the where the protagonist tries to do something about the conflict and then there's the uh, the climax uh, or sorry, yeah, the, the finale, sorry. Finale is sort of like where the action is like in a very heavy state. And then the climax is when the action and the intensity and everything is at its peak moment. Is it, is that the peak intensity, right? Um, that, that's basically where everything is. And then after that point, everything becomes more calm and tranquil. And that's where everything gets resolved. Um, that's the res that's the denouement. Um, everything gets resolved. Everything gets closed. Everything like that. And in this ending, you basically have this new central conflict, this new this new central character, and every this new central concept introduced to you after the climax of the of the game, which technically was the um, the climax was that stupid thing where you're holding off when the missiles are flying. I mean, that was technically the climax of the game. I mean, let's be honest here. Technically, you could, that's arguable. And then I guess you could say the elusive man thing was arguable too. But I would say that the peak intensity was that was there. But that's debatable. But otherwise, but there's it's not debatable that that came in after that, and that's simply defying traditional story structure, um, and that's that's terrible. And the other big thing is Harbinger. He was established to be a very um, the main villain of the of the, the or the lead Reaper or whatever from Mass Effect Two, based on prior the confrontations Shepard had with him there. Um, and then Mass Effect 3, he just comes in as like a cameo appearance or whatever. He just flies down there, wipes the shit out of the, all, your, all your guys, and for some reason, and then he just takes off after that, even though there are more people. And then the people retreat after he leaves, and then it's wide open, and none of them decide to go in there. It doesn't make any sense. I, that's another plot. That's a plot hole. That's a lack of narrative coherence there. But just to have him not be, I mean, to, it just sort of negates his whole... At his whole presence in the second game because he wasn't utilized in the third game at all. That could have been, I mean, there was essentially nothing to differentiate him from the from the uh, any other Reaper when he comes down there. So there's essentially no point for him there, for for the whole uniqueness of Harbinger to even exist there. And to me, that was unacceptable. Um, it it def it got rid of it acted against all the build up from Mass Effect Two in terms of establishing him. As the main enemy of of the of the game, uh, and from uh, the leader of the Reapers, and he just made a stupid cameo appearance, and it was just terrible. Those are th those are basically the problems that I have with the ending, uh, and that and that was very broad. I'm not going to get into the specifics because that would just make that would double the whole length of this of this fucking video. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to go um, talk now about the stupid extended cut. So the extended cut basically did fulfill a lot on its on its promises to clarify the ending. But basically, um, me and um, Arkin Gay, I would just, I I mean I agree with him about what he said uh, about the, about the uh, company. And um, basically, I agree with what he said in terms of how, why you do something is basically just as important as what you do. And um, they were basically trying to meet you halfway. Uh, they're trying to meet. They're sorry. They're trying to meet us halfway between our demands and their whole artistic integrity, which I'm going to get into in, in whenever I get a chance to. Um, but basically, uh, the concept he did like a, he made a, a whole analogy of it. And basically, let's just say that I have some random stranger walks into my house and takes my um, my laptop. All right, something something valuable like that. I'm just gonna say my laptop. Um, you could think of whatever 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 object is valuable to you. Not not a person, not a kidnapping, but um, anything that's of significant value to you. Um, some object that's significant value to you. So in some way, something very meaningful. It gets stolen or whatever. Um, if it's just some random stranger, yes, I'm very upset about it. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be upset about it, but not like it's it's on that person. It's not my fault. It's sort of like, or so it's not. It's it's not my fault in either scenario, but and then I'm gonna talk about here. But it's you don't you know it's sort of like it, well, no actually it's not some random burglar. Sorry, it's just my like some guy I hang out with or whatever comes to my house, plays video games with me, hangs out with me or whatever. I don't even know the guy, and he ends up you know taking my um, taking my laptop. And I mean I'm just like well you know too bad I I don't I shouldn't have trusted some guy I don't even know. That's that's sort of my own fault there actually. Sorry, I contradicted my point there and this and and before but it was sort of my fault because I didn't trust the guy now let's just say I have my best friend come over I've known for 10 15 years or whatever uh, let's just say that and um, he comes in there 
And he and then after we hang out, have a great time, he steals my laptop. And then I'm just like, what the hell? I trusted this guy for such a long time. And well, in this in Bioware's case, it's like five years or whatever. But here, let's just say, I mean, I had trust in this guy. So now it's sort of shattered. I expected a lot better out of him. You know, I expected him to play better. It's like another analogy. It's sort of like Michael Jordan. It's like him getting fucking two points. It's like like one of twenty from the field. And when in like someone like B.J. Armstrong or, or sorry, like someone on the whoever the bare back guy of the of the bench was of the of the 93 bulls or any doesn't matter what season it was um and he scores like 35 points and michael was like scored two points and shot one of 20 or whatever you know it's, it's, it's you expect so much fucking better you trust him to be better than that and it, that's essentially what bioware is doing here and then it said and then the whole proposal thing is essentially the whole uh, extended cut thing is basically like um meeting you halfway like when i call my friend up I'm going to say, oh, hey, did you, did you take my laptop? Uh, can I have a back? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, can I have a back? He's like, no, but I'm going to go buy you a, a nice dinner or like a nice new video game or a nice new pair of shoes. I don't know. But like, he's not going to give me the, the stupid laptop back. And it's just sort of like, he's doing this to appease me, but he's not giving in to my demands exactly. And that that's what pisses me off because they, they didn't really care about uh, like pleasing the fans what they originally intended um, for the extended cut. Um, now, for the um, for the actual extended cut, I actually was I actually, they did sort of they did fulfill a lot of their promises. I mean, the, some of the basic plot holes that people complained about, like for example, the nor um, what what the fuck was it? Um, where where your teammates were when you're rushing into the beam, um, and they how they teleported to the Normandy. Now that's sort of that's explained. But at the same time, Harbinger uh, not being not destroying them at, uh, didn't make any sense. So it sort of created its own little little plot hole thing there. But whatever that that was sort of, that was explained. And then what else? Like the Normandy leaving was, I guess, explained adequately. And um, what else was there? I think they they did like one other one other thing. I mean, a lot of like the post choice stuff obviously was explained. They did a lot of explaining some stuff. And basically, so as for the original three problems that the fans had, it basically fixes like the outcome thing or whatever, right? Um, where it fi it fixes the outcome in that now you get to ha see some of the repercussions of your choices. It basically fixes that. Um, like I, I mean, I would probably make some changes to it. I mean, you know, it doesn't. It clarifies almost everything except Shepard's fate. Shepard, it, 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 except for the destroy ending, it it's it doesn't solidify that, and that that sort of pisses me off. I don't think it's very it's a wise thing to do, um, as is it, and they advise you they advise you me against that in writing classes and anything to have some sort of fucking ambiguous ending like that, um, where you don't even know whether the protagonist lives or dies. It's, it's just unsatisfying towards an audience, and it's not something that you would you'd want to do. Um, it, yeah, it's just it's just not something you'd want you'd want to do, and they did it there, and that that's the one thing that just it it, it doesn't really solidify, and the, the basically the uh, things aren't very character specific, um, like so sometimes it sort of it seems randomized who is sort of um, highlighted in these stupid slideshows. Yes, they're slideshows, unfortunately, they're not full fledged cutscenes, and that that would have been you know film or you know movement is more powerful. Uh, than just sort of still images, in my opinion. Uh, at least for this, it fits more. And so in that regard, yes, it is a little, a little, little cheap. It doesn't, you know, fit. It doesn't work quite as well as it should have, uh, just because of that. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing about um, what was it? Um, your choices mattering. Yes, they they do more now because you have the characters. So which characters live and die are sort of presented in there more. So whatever choices you made, like in the game, like the genophage and everything, are sort of those big choices are good. I don't I don't think the Rachni was addressed though. That 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 whole thing was still sort of left, you know, unanswered or whatever. That was sort of tossed aside still. Um, what, but whatever. Um, and then yeah, so they fi they kind they kind of fixed that part. And then the other final part about the um the cutscenes being or different or whatever, they mostly fixed that I guess to to a decent extent they fixed it. But I, f I still feel like the um control and synthesis options are essentially almost the same thing except Shepard has control of the Reapers in one, um, uh, and he doesn't in the other. And then the people are genetically modified. They're not technically that similar, but they have like the very same similar outcomes compared to the destroy option, where it's a little bit a little different. I, I feel the destroy option is a little bit off. Um, so basically, that's it. That that's what they essentially improved. Um, 
And to, they did a decent polishing job, but they it, they didn't address anything, and they couldn't really do that because they apparently have some sort of two gigabyte um, limit on their on their download, so they can't do they can't cram in a bunch of like a ten gig hard drive that overhauls the entire thing, which seems contradictory in my opinion because a lot of DLCs with actual gameplay and everything like some, that somehow takes up less time. I mean, sorry, less um, space than cutscenes do, I guess. I don't know. I, I guess cutscenes take up a shitload more of space than I thought they would, considering how some DLCs, like the Leviathan, takes five hours, and with the with the stupid extended cut, it's maybe like an hour at most of just cutscenes. I guess I didn't know there was that large of a disparity in size difference um, between the cutscenes and actual gameplay. I don't know. And also considering how all these DLCs have a lot of cutscenes in them, so I have no idea what the hell. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Be honest with you, um, how I don't know, whatever. I don't, it, it just seems contradictory or whatever, it, condescending how they, like how they can bear, like they, you know, it takes them like the whole maximum two gigabyte thing to do the extended cut, yet it takes them the same amount to do something that's a lot longer and beefier. To, I don't know, it, it seems condescending to me, but whatever. Um, and aside from that, the extended cut didn't really fix anything else, and it, it didn't address the new conflict issue. It didn't address the sort of um, the lack of narrative cohesion. I mean, it, it addressed like one or two points, but at the same time, it created like another one in that thing. Um, it it didn't address any of that really, and the, and those are the and the, it didn't address the lack of like the themes or whatever. Technically, it didn't address most of that either, uh, or the, sorry, the contradicting acting against the theme thing. It it, it, didn't, it didn't it didn't address that either. So was I happy with the DLC? I mean, it gave, it gives it gave the fans sort of what some of the what a lot of the fans wanted is just more closure. That's what a lot of people want, and they sit and they get. That's what it gave them. Um, and basically, what I what I'm saying is that um, it, it still doesn't fit. It, it, none of them are really Mass Effect endings. Um, and, oh yeah, so, the last thing is speaking of endings, they added the um, the the refusal ending where you have an option to shoot the catalyst and the cycle continues or whatever that. That one was technically most in the themes of Mass Effect, in that you're always finding another way out, um, another solution. That and that part, because it's Ark and Gaia's favorite ending out of the most, out of all four of them or whatever. Um, and I mean, I would I agree with them about like the sort of theme and feeling of it, but it's technically the worst outcome out of all of them because everyone you you essentially fail. And I don't know if the Reapers are actually stopped because the stupid... It's actually a woman, now, I think, after you choose... Uh, during that fucking stupid epilogue sequence on that other planet or whatever. Um, I don't know if the Reapers are stopped there because you Liara's time capsule thing was there to explain everything. I don't know if the... I don't, I don't, based on my knowledge, I don't think it made it very clear as to whether the Reapers were actually stopped or not. I mean, I guess it implied that it, they were, but I don't... There's no, like, really hard evidence there, so... I, Unless I miss something audio-wise, I'm not very good at listening to, to dialogue like that. That's why I always put the subtitles on, uh, so you could hear, so I could understand better. But um, based on my knowledge, it, it didn't seem like the Reapers were defeated, and if, even if they were, this cycle essentially halt the perished because of it, and it sort of failed an axe. That one to me makes it feel like all your effort was didn't pay off at all the most amount it that the, that's what it is like all your efforts and pay off that one that's the ending that makes me feel the most like that and, and that's what it is I, I don't think that was a very satisfying ending in my in my opinion um now i'll address this um this whole this whole thing about um artistic integrity in bioware all right so basically our, the whole idea of artistic integrity is that if you're an artist um, you have the right um, to do whatever you essentially want with your um, with your work, and a lot. I've always sort of been, you know, brought up that yes, it is the it belongs to the artist. They have the right to make their own decisions about what to do with their own work. Um, you know, it's all. I've always been like that. But this event, um, this ending, has made me um, challenge that uh, idea. Um, I think this is an exception to that, and for very good reason. Um, it's essentially like you just like it's just essentially almost it's just a con it's contrivance. That's what the whole ending is about. And technically, the whole phrase of an artist can do whatever he or she wants. I mean, technically yes, but you have to be within. Like I said before, it goes back to the narrative coherence thing. You have to tie it back to um, the na the universal rules that you're that you're um, using in your fiction. Um, like if you if you start to break those rules. I mean, technically, yes, you can do that, but you can't. 
you can't do that without um, abandoning any sense of um, credibility towards your work. Um, that's why I don't think the ending to Mass Effect 3 is really credible at all because it's it just it uh, it defied the rules and the um, and the, the themes and sort of just the just the rules and um, direction that the Mass Effect series was going to that point. I mean, it's a, in sim most simple terms, it's almost like um, just as using an example. I don't know, like in the Dark Knight Rises, for example. I'm just gonna use that. Um, that's the ending of the trilogy. Okay. Um, basically, you take the ending of that and chop out the last 20 minutes and insert the ending of like of like Star Wars onto there, and then the viewers like, what the fuck? I mean, yes, it's not that, uh, like, you know, blatant, I guess you could say, but it's just as severe as that. It's not quite as, it's not quite as blatant uh, as sort of, a both. it's not a change of genre so much, but it just, it's an aban a complete abandonment of the sanctity of what the Mass Effect series was about, both um, gameplay-wise, I mean, sorry, both game design-wise in terms of choices, and the story, um, and, and that, that's what I think. But anyway, but back to this thing. Um, it, it, this is about how they can't change the ending because it's their artistic integrity. Now, in the past, this has not really been the case because at all you, I'm going to use some examples here. But basically, I know that um, whoever the um, author was of Sherlock Holmes, I can't, I can't remember his name now. Um, he he um, recognized a lot of fans complained about. Um, him killing off some some particular character, I think, and he re I think he rewrote uh, parts of that novel um, because he thought he um, treated the character unfairly, um, and you know that's that's perfectly legitimate. And then obviously there was the other thing with that whole um, it just it, I'll just use a more relevant example in the uh, video game industry was with um, the Fallout Three thing, um, and yes they. It's a little different, though, because Fallout 3, I was not necessarily a part of that conflict, mainly because I did not play Fallout 3 um, right at the time of the release, so I wasn't, I didn't play until like a year and a half later after it was released, I think probably well past the point when that controversy was um, active and prominent. Um, but I guess there's some sort of controversy that um, that your character died or something, so that's how they, and I played it, it's called Broken Steel, the DLC, and it's basically expanding upon the thing, though. You know that they, they, but the thing is, it's it did it did change the ending though. It, it did kind of change it based on what my based on my memory. I don't remember it all that well, um, to be honest with you, because I haven't played Fallout Three in several months at least. Because I I literally played the hell out of that game, and now there's nothing hardly anything left to go back to. Literally, I've got like a twelve hundred gamer score points in there. I've like done all the side quests and shit in that game. It, it, it doesn't matter really. My point is that they the ending was essentially altered or changed as a result of the um, as a result of fan uh, criticism. They were willing to do it, and I guess, I guess this point is just sort of related back to my other video about um, GameSpot and all these other media. I mean, all these gaming sites or whatever, all the media sort of be acting against the fan base on this one. And then it, uh, I don't know. I mean, here's here's the thing: how often has this ever happened before in anything? Like how how often does this happen? Not very often at all. In the gaming industry, this is this is really the second time in about like uh, in about four years, or well, technically the second in in a span of four years. But um, what about what about over the course of like the, this whole recent generation, including the PS2? Um, I would say PS2 has been around for around a decade or so. So in about ten years, in at least ten years, this has maybe happened the second time. So it's on pace for maybe once every five years, um, and that's you know, and that's just saying that that's ten years. Ever since video games has been made, which has been I don't know thirty years, twenty years ago, I don't know, probably, yeah, like somewhere around there, I don't know, but this has happened probably not very many times, and neither in in, in any um our entertainment medium. Let's let's take movies for an example because that that industry is a little bit different. It has some advantages to this uh, if there's like some sort of controversy here because first of all, I would agree if this was if Mass, the Mass Effect series was a movie because the industry works a little differently. If a movie is released, let's just say it's The Dark Knight Rises. I'm going to use that as an example again here. Um, and if everyone hates the ending, if it's like a you know terrible ending or whatever, if everyone hates it, they can't really spe they can't really um do any like 
like, it would require a lot of budget and a lot, they'd have to reshoot everything and stuff like that. It'd be a lot more difficult to do that. And to be honest, it wouldn't really be worth it because their thing is already, um, you know, like their product is already out. And you, yes, you could say this applies to the to the um, video game industry too. And yes, it sort of does, but it's in a, it's in a different sense here because in your in your, in the movie business, you have to get all these people out. You have to have like lighting, um, you know, sound. You have to have a bunch of real people working on this stuff. Actors, everything. You have to, and sometimes because the thing is. In movies, you have to have real set pieces. I mean, unless it's done in like the studio, or even if it's done in the studio, sometimes you have to rebuy the studio. Sometimes you have to you have to haul everyone out, repay everyone to do that. And that's saying if it's a studio production, if it's a, if it's a um, if it's a movie that's shot on real sets uh, on set, that's how they call it. And then they'd have to go and redo, then go to the set again, and then reshoot everything with the actors there and stuff. And that costs money, and it it's not a financially beneficial decision to do that, um, just be because it like costs so much of their um, finance finances and stuff. It just doesn't work that well with the movie industry. Now, though, on the plus side, as you all am probably aware of, um, there's obviously, and this is where um, the movie industry is different, is that there's a second release in the in the home media, obviously, DVD, and now with all these other sites like Netflix and um, I don't know what other, what other movie sites there are, I, iTunes as well, all the, like the you know home re home release, so the the consumer owns the product. That, that that's the thing. That's the thing about um, movies is that the the first release, the person doesn't own it. They just pay something to see it. They don't own the movie. That that's when the the first time the the product is released is not available for consumers to buy. Um, and the second time around, it, it is. And here's the thing with that is that oftentimes in so, in some in a lot of movies, um, there's uh, there's some what's called an extended cut or a director's cut or you know, extended version, extended edition, special extended edition, something along those lines is usually the director's version of the uh, product because obviously in movie in the movie business, um, the producers um, oftentimes sort of dictate a lot of what the director um, does. So the director, and they have like the, they view the script, the, um, the frames every day. Um, Oh, fuck, I, I forgot. I forget what it's called exactly. I'm blanking on it right now, but it's when the producers and the directors um go a after after the production day is done, and then they go and view the um the, the the footage that they shot that for that day, and you know they discuss it and see if it's any good or not. So that that's where the producers have a lot of influence on the director, um, especially if it's like the studio executives or anything like that. They they have their own thing, so it's not just um the director, and that's that's sort of a common misconception. Um, it's, so it's it's not just the director doing it. He's on he's usually on a very tight uh, leash, depending on what type of production it is. If it's a, if it's like a film or a movie, it depends. I mean, if, if it's a film, there's a difference between film and movie. Movie is more just for making money, mass consumption. Yes, you could still have the director and the people like putting a lot of passion and heart into it, but it's the so the studio executive's primary goal is to get out money. Film could be something like documentary or just some other. It's more typically on a lower budget, and it's not necessarily meant for just making money it's more uh ha it's usually deeper and meant for um sending a message um for something it's, it's something along those lines i'm sorry i'm getting a little off a little off topic here but back to this uh extended extended edition or something um the director's cut of this oftentimes the director could actually um you know oftentimes they could um like the, they shape it to be their own version so theoretically, you, they could take fan feedback into consideration, and um, and change something about it for the DVD release. Well, I'm going to use the Avengers as an, as an example. Um, like if when, during the sequence that I mentioned before, when Hulk and Thor are fighting, if I if I and a lot of other people didn't like how it was edited, for example, like I thought this should have been a longer fight, or it should have been sh like shot a different way, or something like that. Um, and Joss Whedon, the director, in that in this particular case, uh, he he sees that a lot of people are complaining about it, presu presuming that he um, responds and you know listens to fan feedback. This is assuming he does, and if he you know if he cares, um, but um, he would take that into consideration, and presumably he would he might re-edit it or something like that. There's multiple examples though. There you know Avatar, I, I believe, was re-released uh, because James Cameron. This is this is a rarity in Hollywood. Is that he actually re-released Avatar and um, in like in with 20 minutes of of extended footage? I didn't go see it, but it was actually re-released in theaters, and it's very uncommon um, for movies to be re-released in such a short period of time. Yes, there 
the, the yes movies are obviously being re-released um now like the titanic in 3d and like the star wars in 3d but these are all old movies that came out usually more than a decade or two ago um but once again i'm sorry i'm going off i told you before that um i usually talk more when i don't have any notes because i go off on so many side tangents here um so i apologize for that um but where was I going? Yeah. So basically, if Joss Whedon was uh, complained, uh, if there were consumers and, pe and viewers and audience members that were complaining about that the way that um, particular action scene action scene was shot, he might re um, e go in the editing room and re you know re edit it and uh, film it a different use different shots and stuff. He might extend some scenes, cut things differently. A lot of a lot of editing is how the the film is presented, and that's uh, that's a very key thing in in that regard. And um, you know, movies like The Expendables has an extended edition, and they ex he, um, Sylvester Stallone um, ex extended several conversation scenes. Ex you know, added some other scenes, expanded on some of the fight scenes, even altering the soundtrack in the in the final uh, fight sequence. So things like that. So theoretically, they in a, in, a, in the DVD release. Um, they could ch they can change good portions of a movie. I'm not talking specifically about an ending, but like different sequences and and stuff. To f oftentimes, for example, in um, what was that the um, sh the 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 um the one with Brad Pitt, uh, Troy that movie. Apparently, the director Wolfgang Peterson disagreed with what the executive um producers were doing or the studio execs, and he like spent three million dollars re-editing it with like forty other um members. And he and to, in order to flesh out a lot more subplots and side stories and characters and to expand the story more, he did that. And because he recognized that there were faults, and he wanted to um you know he wanted to fix them. He wanted to improve that part of the story. And that, to me, just shows you that he really enjoy. He's really passionate about what he does. He cares about the product, and if he recognizes that there's things that need to be improved, he does them. And that those are some examples there. And also, a lot in DVDs they have the um, like th things that are called um, an alternate ending. For example, I, th I believe Limitless has one. There's like alternate and Titanic has one too. Um, you know, so they they range in um, in the extent to which they are changed. For example, the Titanic isn't changed uh, very much and limitless I don't believe has changed all that much either but sometimes they are they are drastically different I believe um the movie seven with Morgan Freeman and um Brad Pitt um they, they like their endings I believe there's like several alternate endings or that there were in existence I believe um and there you know you can sub in any one of them and they have drastic consequences I mean they are sorry drastic differences between each uh, different version of the ending now that that's the movie industry, so there's definitely advantages to in just in terms of like the double release because um in, with the whole media thing because with video games the fruit when it's released that's when the when the consumer owns the product and yes there is con technically considered renting games but I'm talking about like with movies you can't rent a movie before it's released on DVD I mean you can't you can't do that you don't own the game um the and you can't you just can't do that really you know it, it's pay never mind but with with games the like the sort of the equivalent of the DVD release for video for um for movies or whatever is i mean for video games is um is the DLC and that's exactly what Bioware did with the extended cut here they did the DLC they, they did the DLC and the reason why like i told you before about the about if the movie was they can't reach they can't do that like they can't change the ending afterwards like the only way they would be able to change the ending is through edit editing and as opposed to reshooting because i already told you told you about the difficulties that would require at bot at bioware i mean sorry at, in creating video games it's all computerized you don't have to go to different locations and generally i i assume that all this stuff is done at their own studios at their own offices or whatever so it's all done on computers so they don't need all this personnel on there they don't have, need as many people on there or, or, or sorry they don't location isn't an issue and money isn't quite as much of an issue, I don't believe. Yes, it does. It does somehow cost all these people to make. It's you know, you have to pay the actors. You have to keep paying all these people. But it's not. It's not quite as much of a hassle to do that. And now let's go back to this stupid artistic integrity argument. I mean, I can understand what they're talking about, but at the same time, I don't respect the fact that they don't that they don't recognize that there's severe issues with their work. That's that's what I don't care for about their artistic integrity argument. They they they're sort of blaming the fans. Their, their attitude towards the fans, I mean, is on the surface seems good and that they're trying to you know meet you halfway. But I told you about the attitude thing and the analogy beforehand about that. And then I just feel like they're not they're not 
you know, apologizing for their work and they're not recognizing not, not recognizing it. Um, you know, Casey Hudson, for example, I mentioned this in the other thing. Um, he's not apologetic for it, and he locked out all the writers during the process. So I wouldn't really call this. It's really his vision instead of the whole writing team. So I wouldn't really call. That, that's another thing because you, you know it's not like in in the movie business. Yes, the writers get fired or whatever, but it's like the director. You know, it's like his is his vision throughout the whole the whole thing. It's, it's stupid for him to get if him would if he would get like kicked out in the last minute and have somebody else do it because there's going to be clear differences in that. You know, it's, there's clear differences between um, the point and the the last point in that in the Mass Effect Three finale mission all the way to the part where people are complaining about. You could tell because you could tell there was a different there was a a change. You know, there's different people working on it, and you know you, you could just tell that. And, and and just that that's the thing about it is just you could it's it's really saddening to be honest with you this whole thing so just to go back to this stupid artistic integrity argument yes I do believe that they ha technically have the right to their artistic integrity and all that stuff but it's just not it's it's not gonna fly with me if they're not apologetic for their work that's why I believe that Casey Hudson should issue an apology for that for for just the whole ending itself and it's just I, I just think it's a huge it's a huge mess. So artistic integrity to me is not I would I would agree with them in general, just not just not this time. It to sum it up in brief. I mean, it's a, an exception uh, in this case because it just but they botched it so completely and completely and utterly that it's just insulting towards the series to be honest with you. And just things like this don't fans don't complain this much um, for nothing. I mean, I'm just going to tell you that right now, and it's there's good, very good reason why there's this hatred towards that because the series deserves better than this, and the fans I think believe deserve better, and this is where the stupid um, entitled gaming argu gamers argument comes into play here, and that we're entitled to a good ending. Well, you know, it's not just us. You know, it's the it's the people working at Bioware deserve a better ending. We as fans, being devoted and buying their games, deserve a better ending, and most importantly of all. The characters, the setting, the universe, the plot, the story—they it deserves. They deserve a better ending as well, and that, that's just not what we got. And I'm going to talk now about how I would have improved the ending. Okay, so now how how do I go about improving this ending? Do you say? Well, um, I'm going to tell you. And I'm, this is not how I would necessarily end the game exactly in terms of the climax and everything, but I'm just going to sort of roll with a lot of um, what they're doing here. Um, first of all, I'd cut out the whole um, catalyst part, the whole the whole thing, and that th that means cutting out that reference made by the um, that pr the Prothean VI. That, that's what you call it, right? The thing on the um, they found on uh, Thessia um, during that during that mission with Kai Lang and everything that the AI thing, whatever the VI, would have fucking call it. I'm just, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my I'm having a drink of water. I'm losing my voice here because I'm talking so long. I'm not I'm not used to talking for this long straight. But I'd cut that out because it references that there's something controlling the Reapers, so I would definitely cut that part out. Uh, because it references the Catalyst, so I would cut that part out. Um, and yeah, I would cut the, I would just cut the whole Catalyst garbage out. I, I would, I would literally just cut that crap out because it just mars a lot of what the story is. Now, I've, in addition to that, I would for the ending, the the final mission, I would incorporate some sort of decision making thing, where you you know send. Um, different members of your squad to command different um d different things you know you know different regions or to go during different regions then you're so you're in constant communication with them and then as well as having like the um the krogan and all these the rachni and something like ha having that be beneficial as opposed to just having them the, be the war assets you know like have some sort of you know variety in the combat that dependent depends on what you made before the the, the um decisions you made beforehand now, um, for the actual ending part, the whole harbinger thing. I would okay. I'd have him come down, all right, and then we have you'd have like a final boss battle, you know, because in the fucking game, Kai Lang is technically the last like real boss battle, and and he's like really the yeah he's like the there's not really a whole lot of boss battles in the game to be honest. That's that's another reason why I didn't like the Mass Effect three ending is there's no boss battle. That's pretty that's pretty stupid to me in my in my opinion. Uh, I mean, in, but more for story reasons. But anyway, it would be like a humongous uh, boss battle. But technically, you can't. I would have it so like, 
I, I would have it so the Reapers aren't completely invulnerable, just extremely difficult to um, to kill. I only I actually think that that's the case in this in here in the in the case because technically one Reaper can be uh, subject to getting killed by multiple uh, starships at one given time. And this is what I would make Harbinger to happen, but he comes down right, and then you 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 keep going, uh, and then maybe he like black. And you're running towards the stupid um, conduit thing. That's this is another fucking thing that I would need to add some sort of explanation for the conduit. Um, it references that they're like bringing humans up there, but they don't know what they're what they're doing. It sort of like just doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't follow through on that, and the whole conduit thing doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they never bother to shut it down, and it's not really. They don't really know what the use is. I mean, it just serves um, as a MacGuffin. A MacGuffin is essentially just an, it's like an avatar that um what the hell is it called that the precious precious material they were after um an avatar um whatever it was it was worth like a billion dollars or whatever it never explains what it's what how what it is or what, how it's useful it's just um you know it, it just it just its purpose is to just move the plot along and that's essentially what this conduit thing does its only real purpose is to get Shepard into the into the citadel as opposed to serving any having any real reason or explanation behind it um, but anyway mo moving on um, I, I would add some sort of you know point to it or something some sort of explanation that backs it up a little bit better but anyway as for this boss battle I'd have Harbinger coming down and a lot of this is what I, um, Ark and Gaia said with this um, with, with this Reaper right? I mean with with Har the Harbinger fight I'd have him you know keep Hmm. I would have it so yeah you, you duck behind buildings whatever and you have to keep shooting Harbinger a lot I, I don't know how I would design it to be honest with you I'm, I'm this is more of a story related improvement I'm not really trying to improve like the boss battle because I don't know how to necessarily design it but it'd have to be it'd have to be restricted to some to some degree because it's I mean it's, it's hard to render that whole thing in real time gameplay uh, when when that huge when something that big is happening at once and you're trying to actually fight when you're actually trying to fight it um, but I would, I would use the same sort of um, thing, like how how if you took that destroyer thing out, um, that'd probably be in, um, on Rannoch, whatever, you'd probably be, uh, Shepard would be using that thing. And then you'd have Nor the Normandy come in, and when, sh when Harbinger is, is um, shooting his red beam or whatever at you, and blowing up buildings and stuff, or... Like, there'd have to be, yeah, he's blowing up buildings and everything, he's like misfiring, he's like... And, he, and you'd be with a lot of people, by the way. You'd be you'd be with a decent amount of people distracting him and everything like that, and maybe there'd be and there'd be more reapers nearby. There'd be like a humongous conflict. I see. I never got that that huge sense that there were like a, it was like a huge like fucking. I wanted like a huge Lord of the Rings type of battle where there's like all these people fighting. You know, that, that's what I like Cause essentially because it's like a galaxy wide conflict happening right in that on that planet. And I never got that sense in the ending. That's what I wanted to see. And I wanted to see Harbinger come down there and Shepard uses that, that fucking um, laser thing that keeps blowing Harbinger. And then when the Normandy comes in, right, during that thing, and when Harbinger's doing that red blast thing, his, his red blaster, Normandy fires its own thing into that while dodging that at the same time. Now here's where I would incorporate choices. You know that choice where you had like the improvements made from the, the Mass Effect 2 or whatever from like um, like about your ship and everything? This I, I would incorporate that into here. I, I would incorporate that into here whereas there could be three different possible options. You know like the Normandy makes it, everyone's okay. It destroys Harbinger or, or whatever. Like the Normandy surprises everyone's good. Or the Normandy gets like da damaged, like or it blows up, but Harbinger gets down too. Or Harbinger beats the Normandy, and you know, and everyone dies or whatever. It does actually. I, 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 those are just three options, but maybe there could be more. For example, like um, you know, like the maybe the Normandy does beat Harbinger, but it's severely um, damaged, so it has to land down there and it can't get back up or something like that. I mean, but the very best scenario is that I would say. Um, is that the Normandy is still intact, it's still flyable, it, uh, it severely injures Harbinger, um, maybe with a little scrapes or whatever, you know, it's, or otherwise it, you would lose any emotional investment if it doesn't have at least some sense of danger. But everyone survives in it, the, and the Normandy keep conti continuously um, shoots the red, like in, in the uh, little site, the beam segment of Harbinger, so it weakens him, and at the same time Shepard's nailing him down. And then here's where I want to incorporate some sort of... Um, 
um, like like when you're making the cho choices in the real ending during the part where you have like flashbacks to like Thane or whatever who is dying all these people or like all these other yeah like I, in this case um, since you're not actually technically not going to see him again so you, since you oh sorry since you are going to um, see him again in my in this proposed ending um, or my proposed fixed ending you're going to see these characters again I would only have them with the people who are dead like Legion. Um, Thane, um, Warden, and whoever the, I don't know who else died, um, if anyone else died, I can't remember, oh, and, um, Ashley or Caden, whoever died, whoever died there, I'd have, I'd put them in there too. Um, it, like, during flashbacks, then Shepard keeps on doing that thing, and then Harbinger keeps on fighting, and it's like, blows up or whatever. Like, literally, Harbinger just is fucking destroyed. That, that, that's what I would have. And then Shepard just, like, fucking... You know, he, he, he's so he's so happy, or whatever. And then maybe as a result of that, the two people you were with, you're with um, whoever your two guys are, plus Anderson, they're there. And then maybe they get like maybe the other two guys get injured, right? Your, your two guys, because you know, I, I would like the ending to be sort of not sort of inclusive of the the whoever you're. I, I would like the ending to be default to some to some extent. So I wouldn't have the the option to choose whoever you want to go into the final final part. So I'd have him be injured or something like that, or like ha or Shepard tells him to go away. No, well that'd be bad, but um, he tells it like they go they go back to the Normandy. They fly off to go back to the battle, or something like that. And then Shepard and Anderson go up there, and maybe it closes off, or maybe it's closing off or something like that. Um, right as they go in there, so that leads no one else goes in there. And then I'd have to then then I'd change it so like you know Shepard and Anderson are walking together instead of that weird shit where like Anderson's talking about all this implausible stuff where the lack of na narrative coherence co comes in again. Um, so that way the audience can actually understand what's happening. So they continuously keep walking side by side together um, to that panel thing or whatever. And then instead of the sh the uh, Oh, I, I'd have it be either two ways for the elusive man here. His little power thing of being able to control didn't make a whole lot of sense. So either A, I would provide a lot more explanation behind that so it makes it at least somewhat believable or plausible. Or get rid of that entirely and make it so like some sort of hostage situation. Like maybe Shepard's on on that thing, on the council of, or whatever, that, that computer to open up the Citadel to bring the Crucible in. And then he like he um, knocks out Anderson or something like that or he takes him hostage. And then it's more of like a realistic situation. And then you ha somehow, I can't remember, I don't know how exactly I would do this, but you know, you make it... Um, you, you do it so like the, it's still the same dialogue that's playing whatever. You still have that confrontation. And then I... Would, I think it's actually better, it was a better ending to not, like, have him shoot himself. It's like the same thing that Saren did. I actually liked his last line or whatever. I wish I wish you could see the Earth the way I do, Shepard. Or I wish you could um, see the Earth like I do, Shepard. It's, it's so perfect. Like, I, I thought that was a lot better uh, send-off for him as opposed to him just shooting himself. That's my personal opinion. And then I'd have it where Anderson actually lives. Um, and, and I'd have it where, um, but here's, I would do it Lord of the Rings style here where um, you have the thing opening, and then you have the EMP cut the catalyst crap out. The thing happens. And I, by the way, I would have a lot more uh, background information on this Crucible thing. Um, so, like, it's it's not quite as much of a surprise compared as what it does. Um, so, like, it, it, it do something. Remember, like, in Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, when all the guys are dead? It's something that targets them specifically. It, it's, it's something that... Um, that tar it, I'd have to have some sort of background behind the the crucible to make it make sense within the context of the story. You know, like how how destroying the ring sort of tied in with the army. Well, maybe like building this is is designed to eliminate ju just reaper forces and everything. So then it sends the EMP blast out. So having some sort of explanation behind that d beats all of them or whatever. I'd include those scenes from the. Um, uh, from the extended cut where all the people are like going like that from the different planets and pro and I'd make it very character specific or at least a lot of the characters that you care about I'd make them go like that I wouldn't not have Joker retreat retreat or whatever that then that'd be pretty stupid um, and then I wouldn't have obviously the mass relays wouldn't get blown out maybe, maybe like in a bad ending we'll keep that I don't care but I'm not gonna have that because I oh yeah that was the other thing I forgot to tell you about. Um, it, that one goes against the theme of uniting the galaxy because Mass Effect 3, all the time you spend there is actually uniting the galaxy, getting the galaxy ready to f cooperate and stuff like that, and just segregating them off like that with the with the um, with the mass relays like that's just unacceptable. It goes against that theme too. So I forgot to mention that part a while ago. 
but um, I mentioned that now, and I, w I would not have that happen. Um, obviously, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't have the Citadel. I wouldn't have the Citadel be entirely destroyed. I might destroy parts of it. I don't know. Um, but I would have the that whole thing bef first, right? I'd have the whole destruction thing first, where all the guys are cheering or whatever. Um, and uh, I would have it where maybe if the Citadel is exploding, like Anderson and Shepard are trying to get off or something. Um, or uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, I'd have that scene, right? But I'd have it where the extended dialogue is because apparently they cut out a lot of dialogue or whatever where the first line by uh, uh, where Anderson is like, um, have you ever wondered uh, how our lives would be different if this never happened? You know, like that, that's how, that's his first line, and that, I I, don't know, I I really liked his voice acting there, and I felt like the more more of that was better. I li I like that line of it talks about Shepard's kid. He talks about Shepard's kids and everything. I would have that line being, I mean, that conversation in there after all the repercussions of that of the of that EMP blast killing all the um all the Reapers, like all the Reapers are down or whatever, and then um. After that, like after this, is to get a little bit. I don't know exactly how I would do it, but um, like you know, Anderson and um, Shepard are seen walking out there side by side out of the out of the thing, and then Normandy sort of like picks them up, and then after that, it's sort of like the um, the conclusion part of it, where you know you get to see the repercussions of your choices. Um, and now some people like Arkin Gaia or like I don't know if he said it, but like people wanted some text. Um, text um endings about all the little minor decisions you made i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily be against that but i'm not i wouldn't say that that, that is not my ideal choice just be, uh, in my opinion just because i feel like a lot it depends on what choices you're talking about because all those minor choices from like mass effect one were already sort of resolved um from uh like in those emails you got in mass effect two and everything that that's how i felt it was there was some closure there um yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe, uh, like, I want to have a text, maybe, like, you see a lot of those characters again, like, in cutscenes or something like that, I don't know. But then, and then, I'd have it where you have, like, so, you have Shepard and Anderson walking out side by side. I'll have it where he dies, maybe, like, in the bad version of the thing, but I'm just talking about the good, best option here. Anderson survives, Shepard survives there, um, obviously, you know, heavily wounded, they're all worn out, or whatever, and then, um... Like I'd have it like a, like a plot payoff, right? Maybe I'll keep that. I'd keep the Admiral Hackett um, monologue thing because I feel like he would be the bet. He's the best. Um, he he'd be a better thing. Um, he'd be a better speaker, an epilogue speaker compared to Edie is. He is more appropriate to the story, I believe. I feel, but he he'd be describing everyone's you know doing well. What societies are rebuilding as a result of the destruction of the Reapers and everything. Then I have it with Shepard, like a plot payoff with all the stuff that you know during those um, during that sequence where um, you know when you're saying goodbye to everyone, like they all say you know, like for example, uh, when Garrus says, "Oh, we're gonna be retiring somewhere on a beach or something like that," um, or um, Jacob said, oh, "I'm gonna go, let's go to the bar in Rio or whatever." Like I'd have scenes like that. They don't have to be very long, but they do have to be. Um, they they. I would either do that, I'm just talking about either that, right, so you just do that, like, you just see brief brief segments, like, you know, 10 seconds of them talking together or whatever, they don't have to be that, you know, with every character, though, so you you, you know, all the important, at least, at the very minimum, all the important characters, um, so everyone in your squad and all that stuff, and you, you're just talking, so, so at least the characters get some sort of sense of um, closure to each specific character, and you get payback, or sorry, plot payoff um, for what they're talking about. You know, so it ties back to what their what their statement was before, and I, at the very end, you have something. Um, and I admit that's uh, that's one. I admit that's preference, though. I, I admit that's a little that's preference. Um, second of all, I would either have it where after after you beat him, whatever, you actually have a gameplay segment where you get to walk up to everyone and talk to him again. And like in in the game normally, and like see what their opinions are, what they're gonna do now, instead of like the cutscenes and stuff like that. Like you don't, they don't have to. Um, like that, that stuff could be like you know. I, I don't know. <coughs> I mean, I don't know if you know where I'm going with that. But like they're all like everyone's standing there, sort of like what um, what the goodbye sequences were, or whatever the you know before the final push. Except after you beat the Reapers and then you talk to them about everything like that, and then maybe you don't have to you don't have to show it, but you t like talking what they're, they're planning on doing once they're done. 
And then at the, for the very last sequence, I would say, like, they're all... I, I don't exactly know um, how I would end it exactly, but I would make it, like, probably with with everyone. And maybe Shepard with his love interest. Uh, and if he's not... And we, if he doesn't have a love interest, then with Anderson or whatever. And then, and then whoever, like, the, the player's most uh, favored party members are, in my, in my case, it'd probably be Garrus and, like, Liara. Uh, for example, or like two or th two or three most important characters. Well, it, it, this is where it gets a little bit subjective and preference uh, when a lot of these characters could be considered the most important to you because you have different opinions on which character you like. I like Garrus the most. That's preference. Um, so, or either way, you just have them all sort of like what the Gears of War 3 ending was where they're all sort of like standing there and everyone's sort of like smiling and happy or whatever. And like they're glad and you see like a bunch of Reaper corpses or whatever. They're, they're like, there's some sense that they're rebuilding and then you have like the uh, um, the final like music or whatever, you know, like the, basically what the Mass Effect 3 music was, you know, like that, that final thing before you do like the, the three beats, like dun dun dun, and then that's it, like... Um, at, like maybe they're all on the beach or something. Or they're all. They're, it doesn't matter what the location is, to be honest with you. And they're all together, and they're they they know that they they made it through. And then and that it's a lot of it. Obviously, is sort of Lord of the Ringsy. Uh, I sort of borrowed a lot of the format from that. Um, that's again. I, I do. I do feel like um, Mass Effect and Lord of the Rings are very similar, not necessarily in setting, but um, but sort of like plot. I should say is so, is somewhat similar. In a very general sense, um, but that, that's how. It, that's not necessarily how. I mean, I would have to think about it a lot more to be honest with you, in order to give you more specifics about how I would do stuff. It would take a while, but uh, to be honest, it's not worth it. That's I, I, I'm just doing like very, you know very not that specific, just sort of general ideas in there. I mean, I, I feel free to disagree with what I'm saying, but the, and this is not necessarily how I would end it. Another way to deal with it is to have the whole elusive man thing be like ha have his story arc finished at the Cerberus base, so he's dead or whatever. Or have that whole conversation there, so Shepard never ever even has to go up to the Citadel. And to be honest, I think that works a little bit better uh, because I don't, I prefer um, to have Harbinger be the last guy, and not having to go to a elusive man after that. I feel that's a little bit awkward. It's it's workable, but it's not it's adequate. But I I like it better where Harbinger is the last guy, and then everyone's on the ground, and then that's how that happens, so then you don't have to do the, deal with the weird Citadel thing about how they get off, or the Citadel, whatever, that, that's, yeah, but I, I, either option works to an, to a decent extent, I feel like either one of the, either one of those um, endings would be very satisfying, uh, or at least much more satisfying compared to the one we got, um, so that, that's what I, that's what I would, Proposed to, and this just and that, and that just to sort of add a, a sense of narrative coherence to it. So it's not there's not all these plot holes to it. Yes, I probably have in that vague thing. I probably eliminated a lot of them. I mean, there's probably will would be some, but I'd, I'd probably minimize it because I mean any work of art will have plot holes, but it just depends on how many and how severely it impacts the, the quality of the storytelling. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to talk about the future by where what I what I'm going to do. So basically, um, Bioware announced that they are going to be making another Mass Effect game. Now, I believe, I, based on the speculation, it's going to be taking place after the events of Mass Effect 3, and in my personal possible thing they could have done, um, it, that, I think that's just a terrible thing to do, uh, in my honest opinion, just because there's no more story left to tell in the universe. It's like making another Lord of the Rings or Star Wars films after those uh, trilogies or series ended already. There's just no point in it. Uh, it's just, I, I believe Mass Effect 3, like, the ending of that just sort of tainted and ruined like the, the good quality that it was before. And just sort of building up another uh, game after that and based off of that, it's not going to work for me. It's not even gonna be. It's not even a game anymore for me. It's it just. It's starting to just become more of like an action game. You know, it, it's it's losing a lot of the qualities that made me attracted to the to the game in the first place. Um, and my, back to my other point, it's just that it, there's no point left in 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 doing that. I mean, all right, with a with a pre. I'm very. Let me just say that I'd be skeptical about buying a Mass Effect game, no matter or a Bioware game in general. It doesn't have to be Mass Effect from now on, and. Like, in terms of another Mass Effect game, a prequel would probably be the best option because there, it wouldn't be um, by all these uh, fucking plot holes and everything. At least, ho I hope not. 
Um, but I don't have at all. I'm more skeptical, and I'm I have more confidence that Bioware would probably fuck it up in in whatever way they can. Even though I would assume there wouldn't be any whole lot of opportunities for them to enliven's and plot holes in that thing. Um, and I would probably be skeptical about buying that. I mean, I wouldn't be a hundred percent into it. I I would probably I might buy it because it would be prior to the events of Mass Effect or whatever, so it wouldn't have an effect with the whole ending thing. And then another thing would be um, a thing that ha a, a game that uh, um, takes place concurrently with the events uh, of the Mass Effect series. Um, that to me, I'm a little bit skeptical of uh, as well. It, it, like there'd have to be references, maybe, or like you're in the same locations or whatever. Um, might work. It's like it's like what they're doing now with like the Jason Bourne series. Um, we're having like the, it's happening relatively at the same amount of time as the third movie is, this is the newborn thing, and I think that works alright. I mean, it has the potential to work really well here, uh, depending on what point in the story it is. Um, and so that, that could thing. Now, for the act, after that, I mean, I just don't have a whole lot to say about it. I just think it's just a sort of wasted opportunity, and I probably won't be buying that. It's just, it's just the worst possible thing to do, because Mass Effect was always planned to be a trilogy. And I feel like there's nothing left to tell in that whole universe. I mean, there's not, there's no left to tell that's going to be as compelling as the as the Shepherd story because the Shepherd story is the Mass Effect story. Um, the whole the whole universe, that whole world was built up around that conflict. And without the Reaper conflict, the Mass Effect universe has nothing. I mean, that that's the whole that's the whole thing that. I mean, and if the, the Reapers aren't a threat anymore, if there's like something else, then it's, it's not even going to be like Mass Effect anymore. It's it doesn't even ha it shouldn't even be worthy of having the Mass Effect title on it anywhere. Uh, to be honest with you, if they're if they're making it like that, I mean, it's just a pointing disaster in, uh, in my view, um, and I will not be picking that up. It's just I don't know. And as for any other games, uh, I've been playing. I mean, sorry, yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm sorry if I leave this off on a bad note. It's just I don't know with with this. I mean, I was ready back in like Je January or something, or or even like earlier or later last year to stamp this uh, Mass Effect Three as Game of the Year, and it's not going to be. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, I had high hopes for it, and uh, people arguing and saying, "Oh, you, your your hopes were too high. They couldn't possibly have." Uh, you know, met your expectations. I mean, my expectations are pretty reasonable in that they maintain the same level of uh, quality that they have in the past. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to expect. And their quality dipped. I mean, I any of those, or my proposed fixed thing would be that difficult to do, or had, had would have been difficult to do in the first place? Not necessarily, I don't believe. If they put the time into it, I felt Mass Effect 3 was rushed. Uh, Mass Effect 2 was about, well, it was like three years in development, I think. It was like the the first game was released, I think, in May or April of two thousand seven, and the second game was released like in February or late January of two thousand ten. So literally almost two years, or I'm sorry, almost three years um, of development time, or, or like of the release or difference in time between two games. And with Mass Effect three, it wasn't e it wasn't even two years, uh, or so it was. It was barely it was barely two years. Um, Mass Effect Two had about several more months of development time compared to Mass Effect Three, and in that it, it needed uh, another six to months uh, to be like as good as I wanted it to be. I mean, like I said before, my problems with Mass Effect Three uh, extended beyond just the ending. I mean, I felt there was just missed just missteps everywhere because apparently uh, Mass Effect Two didn't sell very well, so now they wanted to appeal to a more broader audience. My friend told me that you know, or my friend told me that someone told him that you know, if if you up like you know, if you target or if you designate something or um, how do I put this properly? Um, if if you if you make a product, if you make something that you want to be accessible, gear it towards everyone, then everyone ends up getting nothing. That's essentially what the thing is like. So if if they're trying like every, like a broad audience, like everyone, then everyone ends up getting nothing uh, for this. And I feel like a lot of the hardcore Mass Effect fans from the first game are probably going to be really disappointed with Mass Effect Three, um, and just a lot, a lot of games um, are just sort of losing um, the qualities that made them, uh, you know, that made them spectacular, and that made uh, consumers like myself want to play them. Um, the same thing I feel happened uh, with Saints Row the Third, um, and that was more severe uh, in terms of the game as a whole. It didn't have the same level of disappointment as something like the Mass Effect Three ending did, but the game as a whole sort of abandoned what um, 
in the Saints Row games as or the Saints Row series um, as a whole. Um, and I'm skeptical. I'm not. I'm actually still gonna buy Saints Row because I don't. I'm not. I don't take it as seriously as I do anymore. I mean, I, I felt the Sa Saints Row two and the first Saints Row game were actually pretty serious. I mean, they're supposed to be fun games, but their their storylines were actually a lot more serious than people uh, gave them to be, but or gave them credit. Um, but um, I felt that was a misstep too. Um, as for current games now, um, Resident Evil 6 just came out uh, a few days ago. I haven't gotten it yet. I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but I'm, I've trusted them, you know. Resident Evil 4 is probably a game for me. That's one of my favorite games ever. Uh, that's like in my top five at least. Resident Evil 5 is one of my favorite games on the Xbox 360 um, t to date. It's, one of, it's in, at least in the top ten, if not higher than that. Um, I felt that was a fantastic game um, all around. So I have high hopes for Resident Evil to disappoint me. Um, with a new Call of Duty Black Ops game, um, I'm I'm concerned about that. I'm I still trust them, obviously. The one thing you got to give Call of Duty credit for, I I know a lot of people hate him, but you can't really be disappointed by a Call of Duty game because you know exactly what to expect. Um, that's the field thing. I'm at, uh, why I continue to um to defend uh, Call of Duty, the Call of Duty series, is that um they make very high quality games. I believe I I believe they don't. Let me let me just say that it's that they their the quality of their games is not dipped. I maintain a very high quality. It's just it's like on the ACT for example. Like it's like the thirty six is the maximum score, right? And I feel like Call of Duty's around like a twenty nine or thirty level. Um, and it, it, but the thing is, people are complaining that you know what they want it the next step. They want it like a thirty three, thirty four. And I feel like Call of Duty could you know take some improvements instead of, instead of stagnating at a at a high level, but they could be a little higher. You know, the fans are right to some extent that, you know, there could be change for the better. But um, what they're staking with works is just that people are getting a little tired of it and they're becoming more perfunctory. If you don't know what that means, it's sort of requiring minimal effort. And that's because a lot of that, a lot of the framework and a lot of the groundwork for their whole series, Call of Duty 4, and that was when it was all revolutionary. Uh, revolutionary. So then everyone bought the game then, you know. It, it was revolutionary back then. And, uh... And then they didn't have a whole lot to, you know, improve it. It was less work for them, obviously. So that's that's that. Halo Four, I'm excited for though. Um, I thought I think that's going to be a real, whole lot of fun. I mean, I liked Halo Reach, so I, I, I like the direction they're going. Um, it's not made by it's made by like three four three studios, but it's I trust what they're doing still. I've I, I've always liked Halo. Uh, but back to Call of Duty, though, I'm skeptical about their RPG elements, like their whole choice thing. I feel like that's un-Call of Duty-like, um, but let, I'll see how it goes. Um, and then GTA V got delayed. I thought, I read somewhere, I thought it was going to be um, released this month, but I guess it's not. It's going to be probably released um, at the soonest, like in December probably, but probably sometime early uh, E1 next year, sometime like in probably anywhere from like January to March or even April. And somewhere in the, in the first few months of next year, um, basically my and basically currently I've be just been playing um, the Batman Arkham City game. Uh, I love that game. That's one of my. I would probably that one and Gears War Three. I think are my uh, top two. You know, runner ups for game of the year. I think I'll give it to Gears War Three. But Batman Arkham City was was up there. I love that game. Um, and I've I'm beating it on like I'm trying to beat it on the new game plus thing. And it's hard. I think I'm gonna do a review on that game as well. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I've been playing this more. I'm going to get Resident Evil 6 probably tomorrow, and I'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I've been doing. I'm just Mass Effect 3. I'm just I'm just disappointed with it, you know? I'm just, I mean, I'm just trying to move on from it, you know? I mean, I've, I've created my own, you know, ending in my head. I'm trying to just forget this whole controversy even happened. Um, but there's a difference between um, forgiveness and forgetting, you know? I have, I'll just make it very clear here that I have not forgiven Bioware for what they did, or more specifically Casey Hudson. I have not forgiven them, and I don't have my trust in them. They, um, they... I they they faltered their trust with me. I I don't I no longer have their trust. You know, it's like the whole best friend analogy. I don't have their trust anymore. Going in the you know whenever they release a new game is now you know a, a risk now. You know, unlike Call of Duty, where I'm gonna buy their games. Call I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm gonna buy Call of Duty if I'm disappointed with it. Then I'll be skeptical. But Call of Duty series has never given me a reason not to buy their games. Um, or some of their games, not think it's a risk going in there. You know, Resident Evil Six. I'm gonna buy that game. As soon as I have the, ch I've not, I haven't had the chance to buy it because I've been busy. But as soon as I give it to tomorrow, I'm gonna be free, so I'm gonna get it. Um, no, no hesitation there. Um, Halo Four, no hesitation. I'm gonna get that GTA Five, no, no hesitation. 
because I have and um, sorry, um, I because I have trust in them. You know, I still trust them uh, as game companies. I trust what they're doing. Uh, I trust them as, um, I still have a level of trust, and I I start off with a you know a level. I start off with a neutral level of trust, and then if they keep if they impress me, then my trust level goes up to a point, and then if they disappoint me, then my trust level goes down. You know that's how, that's how it works, and that's how it works for in life, and everyone basically almost does that. Um, and that's and my trust level with Bioware is now severely faltered. And to the point where I don't, I don't trust a word um, that that comes out of Casey Hudson's mouth because I feel like he, I think he lies. He bullshits everything now. He even bullshitted um, how like after the after people complain about the ending, he's like, "Oh, we're not changing it for the fans. We want to. We personally want to see more closure for it." I'm just like, "Are you kidding me, asshole?" <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just so so to leave it off on that note. Um, I still think Mass Effect Three is a good game. It's a it's a good shooter. Uh, it's a good third person shooter. It has it's it has the best combat out of all three games, but it it's lost a lot. Of, it lost all the like RPG like and story choice qualities. It just it lacked the qualities that Mass Effect One, and Mass Effect Two had in terms of its its essence, you know. But a lot of it comes down to passion. Ark and Gaia, um, you know, he outlined it well. Um, I, I felt like the the tone of the game, the tone is sort of how the the author's attitude uh, towards their work, or sorry, the creator's attitude, and the tone was just not there for Mass Effect Three. The tone was bad. Their attitude wasn't their attitude wasn't terrible, but it wasn't um, there wasn't a whole lot of desire, or passion there. You know, the whole end of the game was just sort of like a trudge there. You know, it's like are we? That's the whole. You could tell like the people making it were just getting tired, and I'm I'm quoting from Mark and Gabe that idea. It's just they're getting tired. They didn't have the same level of care as they uh, incorporated in their first two games, and that's what really pissed me off. Uh, in my opinion, it's just that they're for the game is not, wasn't as high as it was in the first in the first two games, and that's why I'm. Um, I feel like that it needed another, you know, six to twelve months to um, to get it right or to get it at the same level of, of Mass Effect Two at least. And to be honest, it sort of went downhill, you know, trilogy. And, and that's what the disappointing thing is, is because I felt Mass Effect as a trilogy is probably it would have been probably my second favorite trilogy of all time besides Lord of the Rings. I felt it might have even surpassed Star Wars because I feel like in many respects it's actually better than Star Wars in terms of characters and everything. In terms of like, sorry, um character development and actually taking um taking advantage of like different cultural um problems with their species unlike what star wars does where they have all these different species but they don't really incorporate it it feels like i don't know that's a little bit off topic with star wars but star wars felt like it didn't take advantage of the universe even though i love star wars to death it's like now it it's my second favorite trilogy of all time but that's one thing i thought mass effect did a little uh, bit better than star wars at but um but because of Mass Effect 3 in general and, st and the Mass Effect 3 ending, I'm going to have to say that Mass Effect has dropped down to, at best, the third trilogy. The trilogy, I think it still is a f uh, fantastic uh, trilogy, even despite the third game. Um, I, st I still thought it was very high quality, very very good. Uh, I liked it even probably better than the Bourne series, better than um, the Spider-Man series, probably even better than the Dark Knight series. Or sorry, I shouldn't call it the Dark Knight because the Batman, Be Batman Begins was the first one, so... Um, this just the modern Batman series. Um, it, it, it's it's dropped down to be honest with you, just because um, because of the game, and I'm just it's just it's just frustrating for me as a as a fan to see their like go down like this, and it's frustrating for me to see Mass Effect Three go out like this. Not just in terms of the artistic quality, but the back, but the repercussions of it. This whole controversy and this whole you know months of just fans hating Bioware and just you know everything. This whole thing is just sad. I'm talking about just the game, like I said, I'm talking about the whole controversy, the stem, what stemmed from it, from the from the game, the reactions, everything it was just bad. It ruined. All, I mean, I spent a lot of time on the internet here talking in forums and everything. It just ruined my time, to be honest with you. It's just frustrating and painful to even think about. It's just frustrating and it's just painful, I think. It's just bad for to, for Mass Effect as a, as a trilogy to go out like that. You know, it, it, just, it, it should have gone out with a bang. It should have gone out well with it, with people responding well to it. But, Mass, but basically Casey Hudson, he didn't want to have that vision. He, he didn't want he didn't want that or I guess he they, they just they just failed they, they blew it and the, and there's nothing to do there's nothing left now I know they're making new DLCs like the, the Omega DLC and everything but I'm not 
I mean, yes, I did like the the last one, the Leviathan thing, but nothing's going to change anything. I, I don't think I'm going to buy it just because all these new games are coming out. I, I, I don't want to even think about the Mass Effect 3 anymore. And it's just saddening that my that's my attitude towards it. That, that, that I'm sad that that's my attitude. I, I wanted to be, keep replaying it. That's the experience I wanted from Mass Effect, is being able to say, I want to replay this again, like right there. That's the kind of feeling I want. I was like, wow, I, I want to be, you know... And I, I guess Mass Effect 3's ending succeeded in evoking emotions. Uh, that, that's one thing I I um I was taught is that you know artistic piece you know moves you in some way or evokes some sort of emotional response out of you. Then it's at least somewhat passable. And Mass Effect 3's ending succeeded by all means in that category. You know, <laughs> certainly and it certainly was memorable. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I'm um, sort of an uh, leave the leave this video off on but um yeah i'm just very disappointed and you can just leave your comments below on hopefully you stuck this whole long video it's the longest video i've ever made um it's but yeah and i wouldn't recommend watching it all at once but feel free to post your comments below on your, your thoughts about mass effect 3 in general about my ideas that i've presented here or in my other videos feel free to comment on anything like that but um yeah so Goodbye, and um, I'll be able to get past this um, this huge this huge controversy, this negative thing, and uh, move on, and let's and start looking forward to uh, new games like Halo Four and everything, and looking forward. Um, hopefully, we can all sort of look look forward. Me specifically, I and you, everyone can look. You know, having more fun with video games again, like you know, like Halo Four and all the, all these things. You know. I, I want to start enjoying video games again, and um, hopefully in the next coming months I will be able to. So goodbye everyone, and thanks again for um, watching this.